Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we've had a heat wave here in Calgary, and it looks like a heat wave in the Saddle Dome, too, as the Flames are heating up, getting ready for the next season. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And uh, Matt, we'll get to the big news of Nazem Kadri in a bit, but let's talk about a big deal that, that came down. It looks as though, you know, the Flames trying to save some pennies for that new arena. Didn't want to use too much whiteouts. So they just took the Johnny Goudreau name, put Huberto on it, and uh, signed the same deal. So it's a long-term deal. Eight, or I guess uh, seven years at this point, goes through 2030, 2031, which is weird to say. $10.5 million a year for Jonathan Huberto. How do you feel about that? Perfectly acceptable contract. Uh, it's an eight-year deal starting after this season. So You're like- right, it is eight, yeah. Uh, he'll be a nine-year deal, like between the, you know, this con, the end of his contract, and then the start of the next one. Um, to me, it it's one of those it needed to be done regardless, and uh, there's no problem in my end uh, with the Flames signing him for that amount of money in that amount of term. Uh, he, with the type of player he is, he's very much in the sa- similar mold as like a Joe Thornton. So he'll probably end up being effective like through 35, 36, 37. Perhaps not. At, we like, talked about n- this. Yeah, perhaps not as high, but close enough. We talked about this in our last episode, and I think that this is almost an optics thing. I think the Flames may have overpaid a little bit for what the player's worth, but had to, to get that long term. And I think after two players left this summer, 100 point plus players who didn't want to be here, I think they needed, and we talked about this, if these guys didn't sign quickly, um, you know, they'd probably be shipped out of town. But I think this is really a, a deal of the Flames saying, look, we got this new player and he wants to be here. Yeah. And it makes entire sense. And um, this was just the first step, uh, frankly, for this team moving forward to building their team for this season and ensuring that, that this team's going to be a good team for a long time. And while $10.5 million sounds like a lot today, remember that we're only paying him for 2022, 2023, $5.9 million. And it's also expected that even either twenty. 20- 22 20 or sorry 2023 24 24 25 the nhl is going to be increasing the salary cap some think by about five million then so while ten and a half seems like a lot now i think by the time we get into a big cap bump it's not going to be as big of a cap hit as we think it is now yeah 10 will be the new eight exactly yeah so i think you know it'll be it won't seem as bad by then and you know what i mean i've seen a lot of people on twitter and you know flames media talking about this deal Matt, tell me if you would agree with this, but I think if the Flames can win the Cup in the next two, three years, nobody cares anymore. Like, as long as they can make this deal convert to a Cup, it's a good deal. Well, even if the Flames remain extremely competitive and are, like, constantly, like, basically winning our division for, like, the next four or five years and continually there in the conference finals and Stanley Cup, and you know being one of the elite teams then it'll be a full value for dollar deal yeah and i i think yeah i I mean if if the flames win their division but can't win the cup i think we all look back at this and go wow we paid a lot of money and didn't get the result but i think with this deal and the deal we're about to talk about with cadre i think they're setting themselves up for those big names that they need to win yeah and how would you say this team like especially with everything that happened they needed to set themselves up so that way they could uh compete not only for this season but each of the next handful of years and like i know like when Gaudreau and kachuk left some fans were basically clamoring for this team to rebuild but the team as a whole was too good to just rip the bandage off and you, you know like if the flames didn't replace kachuk with huberdo and Uyghur, the Flames probably still make the playoffs just due to the strength of their organization. It's just that, you know, there's a difference between making the playoffs and competing for a cup. And, well, they're going to be competing and for a cup. And let's be honest, not just the strength of their organization, but probably the, probably also the weakness of the Pacific Division. True. That kind of goes without saying. Like, really, it's the Edmonton Oilers and nothing else really yeah 
I, I think, you know, we've we've got to be honest there. It's not just the Flames being good necessarily, but the fact that the Pacific Division would be weak this year. Yeah, like, realistically, like, L.A. is going to be okay, and Vegas is going to take a step back because of uh, not having a proper starting goaltender. And, yeah, like, the, their team's kind of in limbo mode, so it's, you know, all things are open right now. Well, the Flames made that deal. Huberto uh, announced that he would wear number 10 as a Flame. We weren't sure because 11 is taken, so Huberto will be wearing number 10. But when we talked last show, we said, you know what? The Flames probably need at least one more piece, and they went out and got it. I can't remember the last time that the biggest piece in free, in free agency lasted almost a month without getting signed, but that's what happened this year. And finally, he has a home. Nazem Kadri has signed with the Calgary Flames. It's confirmed he will wear number 91, previously worn by Kelly Yarncroke, the only Flame to wear it in the preseason. And uh, Nazem Kadri, who is currently 31, turns 32 in October, signed a seven-year, $7 million deal, which is $49 million, the second largest in franchise history after Huberto. Matt, I know you've had some thoughts on, on uh, Kadri over the years. What do you think of the Flames acquiring this player? Uh... uh entirely a the perfect signing basically for where the team's at uh Kadri is a very good two-way player excellent uh defensively uh you can see on youtube there's all sorts of highlights of him getting in mcdavid's face which that's what we need um and it, it, it's one of those where like the flames really their main achilles heel last year uh, was Sean Monahan not being a viable center uh, for all of last season. And, like, the Flames basically were stuck with a third-line center as their second-line center in Michael Backlund. And that's not a slight on Backlund, but, like, there's just not the same degree of offensive skill that an elite team needs from their number two pivot. And uh, Monahan was not an effective NHLer last year. Uh, so th it was a glaring weakness in this organization. And so now to go from that to having three of the best defensive centers in the NHL and three guys that are all good at putting up points, it's just perfect uh, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, one thing to note, um, Nazim Kadri is the most effective uh, passer in the entire NHL at getting pucks into like right in front of the net which might bode well for Elias Lindholm or Andrew Mangiapane uh, say like on the power play or if Mangiapane is playing on Kadri's line uh, he's extremely good at getting those pucks to the front of the net which will be very important for this team you were mentioning sort of his skill set, and at the announcement of this trade being made, general manager Brad Treliving said that Kadri has a unique blend of skill and snarl. And I, I like that uh, that phrase. I think he's totally right there. I think, you know, you and I talked about a lot of what Kachuk brought to this team, that quote-unquote snarl, but also Kachuk's lack of discipline and things like that. And I think we get a lot of those same attributes with Kadri but much more disciplined, much more focused, a guy who's probably not going to go into business for himself, a more, let's call it, mature version of the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, Kachuk quite frequently would fly off the handle trying to do too much, like jumping Klingberg in the Dallas series and injuring his hand. Uh, Audrey used to do similar things in the early part of his career, but as he's gotten a little older, he's matured and not quite pushing the envelope to the same extent so that's going to be a very good thing for this team uh this team needs a good first and second line center frankly i i'm expecting elias lindholm to be paired with uh, jonathan huberdo and Kadri with manjapane to start the year well, let's talk lines a little bit later but uh you know it, it just gives the flames m significantly more options instead of um you know, like, you need to put so-and-so on this line because there are no other options. So, you know, it just makes things a lot better. How do you feel about signing a guy who will be 32 pretty much when the season starts to a seven-year deal? Uh, not ideal. Um, 
you know, uh, with his, the thing is, is that he's an extremely fast player. And fast players, like, if he loses a step, he'll still be above average. And his playmaking ability and his shooting ability are still fairly good. Like, he was on pace for 30 or more goals in four of the last six seasons over an 82-game schedule. So, like, he can score. He can do the whole passing thing. And by the time, like, he gets into the 36, 37, 38, 39 uh seasons uh his seven million dollars will be much like backland's co- contract at like five and a half where yeah it's quite a bit well again yeah he's... by the time we by the time we factor in that uh that cap increase yeah so like by that time you know like Kadri would more likely be your third line center um and like your basically like what lucic was when his first season here and you know slightly declining as he goes along and we'll probably dump him to like Arizona or the like at the end of his contract just to free up space or eat it if Hopefully we're Hopefully Arizona's still not bad by that time, right? Well, I'm just using them as the cherry pick <laughs> default bad team. I mean, they they got to figure this out at some point, don't they? It's Arizona. Uh, I, you know, they've been bad since the Winnipeg Jets joined the league, so yeah, maybe <laughs> Se- seven years from seven years from now they'll be playing a one thousand seat arena and he can go play for them. Yeah, pretty much. Hey, you know what a Some hockey guy's stick backyard is? Backyard rink. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and it's I, I think you know the seven million like we talked about when you factor in, let's call it a big um a let's call it four million just for the sake of argument in either twenty twenty two twenty three or twenty three twenty four, um or sorry. 2022, 23, yeah, 23, 24. And then let's say that they even follow what they have now, which is about a million bucks a year. I mean, by that point, you're going to have about a $7 million inflation. Like, I think that by the time we get to the end, I don't see him playing as a Calgary Flame for the whole contract. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Flames have one or two really good years if he might hang them up early or, like you said, trade him away or a team who's looking for some veteran depth. I don't see him being here for seven years until he's 39. But I don't think the contract's going to look as bad when we think ahead to projected salary cap numbers no and i think that like unless his play completely falls off the cliff um say in year four of the contract which i don't see like there's no uh clear signs that like it's going to be that bad you know like it's one of those where you know the trading like the last three years of his contract like there will be teams that would like a depth center and like the flames might have to eat something like a bad contract of their own or whatever whatever but you know like the flames will get three or four years at least of a really good player and then you have to figure out and evaluate when the times where the team's at where everything's at that's a that's a later problem. I think again, this yeah. to me signals this team's intent to win now, and it's just like you know what, let's win now. I think you know if we look at the age of some of these players, I think they have a two three year window, and then we'll solve that problem after that. Yeah, pretty much, and you know, like guys like say Michael Backlund, like in two years, like they, I don't know if the Flames re-sign him, uh, just because you know he'll be thirty five then, and and and. So, you know, it we'll see. But for it's basically this year and next is the key for the Calgary Flames to compete and be as amazing as possible and then figure things out when, you know, we hit 26, 25 and 26 and beyond. You know, an interesting thing I was thinking about with this trade, Matt, um, and I don't know if you've really thought about this or not, but if you remember back in in uh, 2019, it was rumored at the draft that the Flames were going to trade TJ Brody to the Toronto Maple Leafs for Nazem Kadri, and it apparently came very close, but Kadri vetoed the deal. Well, if we take a look now, TJ Brody's in Toronto, Nazem Kadri's in Calgary. So the deal got it, done it eventually. Just, yeah, it, it all worked out in the end. Kadri got his cup. Hey, everything's a winner. 
<laughs> and for fans, I know there's been a lot of people talking about this. The fact that, oh, well, didn't Kadri veto a deal to Calgary? Uh, again, we can only go by, you know, what Kadri said and what we've heard, but it's it's been said that Kadri wasn't against necessarily coming to Calgary. He just didn't want to leave Toronto at the time. And he had a limited no trade. Calgary was on it and he didn't wave. And he eventually got sent to Colorado because Colorado was on his list. So it's not... It's not believed that he's ever had anything against the Calgary market. It's just that uh, at the time, he didn't want to leave Toronto. Well, Matt, speaking of future considerations, the Calgary Flames did have to move some money to make the Cadre deal work. They would have been over the salary cap, so they had to make a tough decision. And the Calgary Flames traded a uh, longtime Flame, Sean Monaghan, to the Montreal Canadiens with a potential 2025 first-round pick in exchange for the uh, the very famous NHL journeyman, Mr. F Considerations, Future Considerations. Um, I'm not going to go into all the possible conditions on this first. This is the most convoluted trade I've ever seen. It's like if Brad Treliving wakes up and his socks are blue on draft day, then it becomes another year. And if Montreal, you know, if the GM doesn't need a full bowl of poutine, then it becomes a 2026. Like, I don't know. I have no idea what they were thinking. All I can think is Brad Treliving was moving his daughter into university that day, which has been noted. I think he just didn't want to do any work, and he just wanted to be on the phone and come up with some convoluted so he didn't have to move boxes. Yeah. <laughs> Any excuse will do. Uh, that dresser looks heavy. Hang on, let's put some more conditions on this. She's moving yeah, the dresser. Just keep talking to me. <laughs> we'll put you on speakerphone. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, Sean Monahan, a guy who's played for only one team in his career, um, Calgary Flames, drafted first round, number six overall in 2023, and he's played here since the 2023-2024 season. No longer Calgary Flame. Now moves on to Montreal. Yeah, so it, I think, you know, Monaghan's had his ups and downs, and I just think we should say thank you, Sean Monaghan. He's been a great flame on the ice, off the ice. He's been a great community guy, great with the media. Yeah. He's going to be missed. Oh, yeah, and, like, the Flames would not have traded him had his body not failed him. Um, it's literally just one of those things, unfortunately, with the amount of surgeries he's had to have and the significance of them, like, I don't really know or think that he will have much of an NHL career after this um it, it, it just sucks you know and it's it, the player that reminds me the most is Adam Deadmarsh who was really good for both Colorado and LA back in the early 2000s and late 90s and absolute dynamic player and then he ran into a bunch of concussion issues and had to retire around 27-28 uh, which is roughly where Monaghan is now. And, you know, like, I'm hoping for the best for him and hope that he can uh, get back into some way of playing. And if not, at least um, hopefully his physical ailments don't impact his life too severely uh, in his post-hockey career. Um, it, it just, it's really disappointing to see like he is the leading goal scorer from his draft year for a reason. Like he's a really good player and it just, it sucks, uh, you know, and like, there's nothing anybody can do about it. It's just lousy and, you know, all the best to him in Montreal and just hope that he can hopefully find some success moving forward. If we take a look at his numbers as a flame, he has 656 career games, 212 goals, 250 assists for a total of 462 points and 153 penalty minutes. So, um, you know, a fairly accomplished flame here. And I think Deadmarsh is a, is a pretty good, um, you know, I, I guess, comparison. I think even if he can play at an NHL level, even at a third, fourth line level, he'll be around for a while because he is – you know, a good guy in the room, good guy in the community. I think he's making the best money he's ever going to make as an NHLer, but I can see with 32 teams in the league now, somebody bringing him in as a third, fourth line guy if he can still go. Yep, and it's literally just on him, and hopefully he can make the most of it, and all the best to him. And, you know, like if, say, like this upcoming off season, if he wants to come back, like I would not be opposed if he's up to it physically. But, um, yeah, it, it just, it, it's one of those bad situations where we just needed to get rid of his contract. It wasn't about getting rid of him specifically. And it 
cost of... I think as a person, we would have liked to keep him around, but $7 million for a, a guy who's probably not even going to be on the third-line center, that's a big big money deal. Yeah, especially when you can go get Kadri, who's a first-line player on most teams. You know, like, it, it yeah. just doesn't make any sense. And, you know, um, as for the... Uh, what, do you, uh, what do you think the likelihood is that uh, Monaghan ends up in Columbus, either the deadline or the offseason, and uh, rejoins Johnny? Quite possible. I wouldn't be surprised if that's his next destination next year. Can I give you one interesting th- one interesting fact here, Matt? Sure. On March 2nd of this year, the Calgary Flames acquired Michael McNiven from Montreal in exchange for future considerations. Now on August 20 on August 18th, the Flames got future considerations back from Montreal as part of that Monahan trade. So, I don't know where this what this uh, future considerations is going to amount to, but it seems like with Montreal, we've been flopping it back and forth. I mean, I'm sure at some point somebody's going to buy the other a sandwich or something, but I, I just found that funny that we we got future considerations from Montreal and now we're giving them to uh, Montreal. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. I had even forgot that we had Michael McNiven at any point this season. Yeah. Uh, he, I don't even think he played in Stockton. It was just more, hey, we need a body in in, in case of emergency. Pretty much. And, yeah, then, oh, we don't anymore. Great. <laughs> um, so with this deal. Yeah, oh, sorry, I just wanted to talk about the first round pick for a minute. Um, it reminds me a lot of the situation back when uh, the Flames traded Alex Tangay and then traded for Mike Camilleri, where like we got a first rounder from Montreal back in like 2008, uh, and we sent our first to uh, LA for Camilleri, and it ended up being like three picks difference. That first round pick that we got from Florida, I, and like uh, whatever the condition of all this ends up being. It seems like it'll be a, a number, like, say, like, four or five pick difference uh, by the time all is said and done from where uh, Florida's pick and wherever, whichever of the multitude of picks <laughs> that are possible to Montreal will be. So, it, it, so Matt, there's a, and I'm showing it to you here, there's a flow chart that's been created by a user on Reddit. I will post this in the show notes when we post the show. So if anybody wants to try and better understand this, you can go look at the flow chart on firesidechat.ca. Yeah. Um, as far as I'm concerned with that, I'm under the assumption that pretty much, unless it's like a, like the Flames are in the conference finals or winning the cup, uh, in 23-24, that it will probably be that pick that goes to Montreal just due to the fact that teams tend to prefer drafting sooner so that way they can get the assets sooner and develop them sooner. And uh, especially with Montreal being in a rebuild, um, both Florida and Calgary uh, being very good teams and likely going to continue to be for a number of years, that it's not likely that like any of those picks will be bad. So I think uh, Montreal probably will take the 23-24 pick. But you never know until we get there. We, we never know. And, yeah, I mean, the fact that they have um, – the fact that I guess they have so many options on there, you never know. And who knows? I mean, obviously the Flames can't move some of those picks now because they're potentially committed, um, which is going to be – odd too for tree to not be moving picks but yeah i mean we'll see what happens down the road maybe the habs move one of their picks in another year and sort of want to um you know restock it'll be it's very confusing yeah um it's just one of those weird quirks and you know i do have to applaud brad to living this offseason for doing lots of weird unprecedented stuff like the first sign and trade in NHL history and like the first multi-page conditional list <laughs> for one one asset. <laughs> hold hold my beer. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, Let, let's and, make and, you know, let's make say, these deals as would, weird as possible. <laughs> that's right. It's almost like at the last GM meeting they had like a GM bingo card and he's he's determined to get all the things no one's crossed off yet. Yeah. The winner gets a free dinner at Boston Pizza. Oh, wait, he can probably already get that. Um, but, yeah, it is it is weird. Like you said, first sign and trade. I didn't think about that. But, yeah, that's pretty much what it was. Um, 
the I have to think that I do not want to be the guy at the NHL office that had to process this trade and figure out all the weird conditions on this first, and then also down the road figure out which one goes where. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, you guys figure it out and contact me when you figure it out. Sure, fine, whatever. <laughs> just <laughs> call us when, when you need us. When it's your turn to draft, just one of you go to the stage. Yeah, we're good. We don't care. Just do it. <laughs> so if we look at the totality off season now, out has been Johnny Goudreau, Sean Monahan, Matthew Gachuk, and Eric Goodbranson. In has been Jonathan Huberto, Nazem Kadri, Kevin Rooney, and Mackenzie Weger. So looking at the totality of where the Flames were at the end of last season after their crushing loss to the Oilers and where they are now, Matt, would you say this team is better, worse, or just different? Uh, significantly better. Why do you say that? Um, well, frankly, uh, Kachuk and Goudreau, as good of players as they are, they're wingers. And uh, championship teams generally are good up the middle. And Sean Monaghan was not really much of an NHL player last season, not due to his fault. It just, you know it literally was as it was like you know not much you can do but um getting uh Nazem Kadri uh to and uh Rooney um makes the top four centers Lindholm, Kadri, Backlund and Rooney like that's a really deep really good two-way group of centers and like if you look at teams that have won the cup over the last you know 15 years Usually they have three good two-way centers, and the Flames, you know, they do now have that. And uh, Huberto is basically Gaudreau, but taller. So, like, that kind of equivalates in my head. And getting one of the best defensemen in the NHL on top of all of that. You know, because, like, how would you say, if you break it down, like, uh, Huberto and Kadri are not slightly not as good as Kachuk and Gaudreau, but the positional difference between Kachuk and Kadri it balances it quite a bit. Um, Rooney versus Monaghan, um, Rooney is at least uh, not dealing with a whole injury situation, so I would actually give it to him slightly, just because of that. And uh, Uyghur over Goodbranson a million times over. So, um, for people that aren't really aware of uh, Uyghur, because uh, he's kind of been talked about more as an afterthought, um, it, he's more or less like the same type of player that Mark Giordano was when he was 28, 29. Like, just a really good two-way defenseman. So, you know, like, that, that's a very unheralded and huge piece of the Kachuk trade. You know, I think all the things you mentioned are important, um, but I think even before I get to if I think the team's better or worse, I think the biggest thing here, the Flames have now changed their entire core outside of Backland in two years. I mean, one of the knocks on this team forever was no matter what coach we had, Gullitson, um, you know, um, Peters, Daryl Sutter, there's always this sort of stigma around Calgary. These guys didn't want to work. These guys were all freelancing. This wasn't a team that came together. And I think there were some issues with the core here. And yeah. I think with Monaghan leaving, we've now changed the makeup of this team. We have new leaders. I mean, the only guy who had a letter last year that's still here is Backland. I mean, we've moved everyone out who is in a leadership position. I think more than even what's on the ice, the Calgary Flames have redefined their identity as a team on and off the ice. And I think that is the big thing that we're discounting when a lot of people are saying maybe the team's not better. I think the Flames moved out a lot of guys who maybe were – you know, entitled. I think we heard Daryl Sutter say that a few years ago. Maybe guys who, you know, weren't buying into the team concept. And we have a whole new group of guys up top. But I agree with you. I think that this team for the short term is a better team. I mean, Kadri's in his 30s. Huberto is going to be 30. Yeah. I think, you know, for the next two, three years, this is a better team with Uyghur in that mix as well than what we had both on and off the ice. Yeah. And you also have to factor, like, you look at, like, um, say like with me uh, specifically talking about like uh, expectations for the team 
and like each year I'd be doing my season predictions based on just like the raw talent of the organization at the time and continually every year the flames would fall short it, including like that year when like they got hammered by Colorado like that was an embarrassment and then they didn't really bounce back much they did but like they didn't progress really that far uh, after losing and embarrassing themselves to Colorado because they kind of embarrassed themselves against Dallas and then this year against Edmonton they did the same thing and it's one of those things where like if for whatever reason those guys aren't getting it done you know it hurts but you should look at changing out the deck chairs and um to look at um the toronto blue jays uh to con make a comparison uh like in the 80s and early 90s like they were continually like the best team in their division but they could never in the playoffs get over the hump and they made a trade of uh, tony fernandez and fred mcgriff who are two of the key players on that team and they got roberto alomar and joe carter and they ended up winning the world series because the rest of the makeup of the team was good it's just they needed to make some adjustments in their lineup and i think the flames moving out gaudreau kachuk and monahan bringing in huberdeau and especially Kadri, who has a lot of experience won the stanley cup you know like just the feel and nature from the team like you have uh tyler to who made the finals and he's won a stanley cup like there's more winning around the organization now instead of people that are well, trying to learn saw on that the job. last year with some of the guys they brought in yeah right with lewis and stuff like that i think that they just started going for more veterans who have stanley cup or playoff experience yeah and you know like it's one thing to learn on the job um like what it takes to win and young players they do need to do that but you also need to be able to take steps forward and it's like this uh last playoffs like they blew all of their energy trying to beat dallas and then the the players that aren't here anymore basically stopped playing against edmonton and you know that was it for the flames and you know it's you know like moving those two out um and getting players that you know that are different <laughs> even um will help and i think you know just changing the identity in the mix you know and like this becomes more andrew mangipane's team and dylan dubay's team in addition to like the guys like backland coleman lindholm yeah and i i think these new guys as well are going to be a key part of that identity i mean you're saying you know um mangipane's team and that i think it will be huberto's team and Kadri's team like those are are going to be big parts of the Flames' identity for the next seven years. Yep. And, you know, like, I'm actually expecting Eat Bread uh, to have quite a season. I would not be surprised if Manjapani cracks 40, 45 goals this year with the playmakers that are on the team. So, you know, like, that'll be a big step for him as he's now going to be the guy that's relied on to shoot more. Um uh, where he was just a guy on the second line now he's one of the primary scorers on this team and you know he has to take the bull by the horns and run with it you know i i think if you look around at almost any team that thinks they're going deep whether it's in the off season or generally it's done you know at the trade deadline these teams are veteran heavy yeah. You, know, you don't see too many young teams going to the Stanley Cup Finals. And if you look, yes, we brought in a 29-year-old Jonathan Huberto. We brought in a, you know, a 32-year-old Nazem Kadri. But you need those veterans, like you were saying earlier. You need those guys who have playoff experience, who have just NHL, you know, Stanley Cup experience, or just have been around the league for a long time and had success. Yep. And with Trevor Lewis coming back, with you know Blake Coleman last year, who they brought in, like I feel like the Flames are. Are in they're in win now mode. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you and I had talked about should they rebuild? Is a rebuild the right thing to do? They're in this to win now. And to me, this roster, do I think that it's 
as well off long term? No, but I think if they're looking to win now, I think this is a better roster for the next two, three years to make a run for the Stanley Cup. Yeah, and plus you have to look at like Daryl Sutter, right? He, it, you know, like a guy like Tyler Toffoli, um, Sutter doesn't need to go and yell at Tyler Toffoli. Toffoli knows damn well if he's not playing right. <laughs> Or well, and we'll make adjustments because he's been under Sutter system before, and he knows how to play and how to play effectively. And you know, it, it having like those leaders who do know what they're doing, and like they don't need to be told, um, that will also help. And I think that's probably true of all the guys that were here last year as well. They now know Sutter. They know what's expected, whether you're to Foley or Coleman or you know, Backland or Lindholm. I think all these guys now have sort of gone through the Daryl Sutter boot camp, being here with him for a year and a bit, and are probably more comfortable in that role now. Yep. And especially with how everything has been, like, yeah, it helps to make the team, like, there's expectations both with, like, the from the coaching staff, but from each other and i think that like now like with guys like manjapani and dube getting more of a prominent role in the team that like it's more like the onus is on them to not let everybody else down and i think that like the internal pressures will help the the younger players that are on the cusp like dube manjapani peltier to rise to the occasion I think it could be right, yeah, and and a veteran group to play with. Mm -hmm. Well, Matt, with that, let's talk a little bit about the forwards. We'll specifically focus on the forwards for right now. What do you think our forward lines look like come, and let's not even say opening day, but let's say Christmas, once we maybe had time to iron out some of the who plays best with whom. I'll give you Eric Francis' predictions here that were released, and then we can talk about our own. Francis predicts line one is going to be Huberto, Lindholm, and Mangiapani. Line two is going to be Peltry, Peltier, Caudry, and Toffoli. Line three is Coleman, Backlund, and Dubé. And line four is Lucic, Rooney, and Lewis. What are you thinking, Matt? Um, I think that this, uh, frankly, Treleving is not done. And I'd be kind of surprised if the Flames don't get an additional player uh, between now and the start of uh, training camp. Uh, having Munjapane... So where do you think that player would fit in? Uh, on the right wing uh, somewhere. Probably first or second okay. line. Um, I'm going to go into it a little bit later, but I think that um, having Munjapane with Kadri will be a uh, more important uh, thing for this season uh, just because um, Kadri is very good at finding players in the slot um, and that's where uh, uh, Manjapane likes to be. So I think that like having those two guys together, like Huberdo and Lindholm, they both kind of Lindholm does basically the same thing with going into the front of the net. So like Huberdo is going to be able to find him. And like if you throw Manjapane on that line, like you'll have two guys in the slot and one guy to pass, and like it, it just feels a little heavy. It, where you know like if you can spread that wealth a bit and have like a, a guy like even having Tyler Toffoli on the first line although not ideal uh, due to foot speed um, makes more sense because Toffoli can score from further away it, so it just creates more options all right well let's start it let's start at the top so you're based on who's here right now your top line would be Huberto Lindholm I imagine and who um, Toffoli. Toffoli on the right? Yep. And then your second line is Kadri and Manjupani, you said. Who do you put with them? Uh, Dylan Dubé on the right. Or new guy. Okay. Okay. So then your third line has got to be Backlund, Coleman, and who? Peltier or Dubé. Okay. And then your last line is Lucic, Rooney, and Lewis? Uh... Peltier, if uh, Dubé's on the third line, or as is, I w might okay. you might also so see uh, Adam Rajitska as the fourth line center with Peltier and say uh, Rooney or Lewis 
it, with Lucic not necessarily being in the lineup all the time either. So, yeah, it, it, it'll it depend. I think the Flames are going to carry 23 23- – I think the Flames will carry 23 players instead of 20 or sorry, 22 instead of 23 guys this year because they have easy access to their farm team. And I'm going to make another prediction here that I don't think Jacob Peltier is a Calgary flame this year for the majority of the season. I think especially moving the AHL team to Calgary, they're going to want to sell tickets. And I think leaving Jacob Peltier down there, a makes sense, but I think that they can also sell some more tickets to come see Jacob Peltier play. Um, I don't know that you need him in the NHL this year. But with that, the lines I would go with, based on who's here, I think my first line would be Huberto, Lindholm, and Toffoli. Toffoli on the right wing. My second line, I would go Kadri, Mangiapane, and Coleman would be my second line. Then I think you've got um, Michael Backlund. If Dylan Dubé is still here, I think he's on that line. And that's where I think, again, you need a new winger. And the last line becomes Lucic, Rooney, and I think they'll put Lewis in because uh, Daryl likes Lewis. But like you said, I think you know that one of those guys might get rotated out with um, Rajishka or somebody else. So I think really we're probably missing one winger, which is a third line. I don't think there's really much room in the top six, but I think they're probably missing a third yeah. line winger. And um, you know, like my main thought um, uh, for what's coming uh over the next couple weeks i would not be entirely surprised if the flames decide to move noah hannafin um the reason being is that mckenzie Weger is basically going to take his spot as the number one left uh handed defenseman and that's gonna weaken hannafin as a tradable asset moving forward um like i and um like if you're looking at like just raw asset management, um, moving Hannafin a little bit more sense. If you were to, you know, put him up for bid basically by from other teams, like um, he's a 24, 25 year old defenseman, number one first pairing defenseman, uh, making four and a half million or five million for the next year and a half, um, like that that's a big deal um for a lot of teams uh both from a cost certainty aspect um and i think that it allows the flames some more flexibility like i'm under the assumption that the flames are going to sign mckenzie Weger for like a six seven eight year deal in the same vein as huberdo i yeah i think that has to get done before yeah. you'd move any um, defenseman but like if that's the case and like you're basically in effect uh switching uh Weger out for hannafin you could get a young, uh, high-quality top six forward and a young defensive prospect in a trade for Hannafin and, you know, um, basically spread the wealth a little bit organizationally and get some more, a little bit more youth. So you, so you mentioned you mentioned wanting a right winger. Who could you see being the return uh, for it, that? It really depends on which team and what uh because like literally 31 teams would be interested in noah hannafin so it would literally depend on that like if you were to say flip him to washington getting a guy like anthony mantha and like one of their good defense prospects would be a very good return for hannafin and you know like it's one of those where like you could get another good top six forward for Hannafin and then some just because of both his cost certainty of his contract and getting uh, like a good prospect as well. And like, I, I would want that uh, prospect, whomever it is to be a defenseman, just because the flames don't really have a, a ton of depth on defensive prospects uh, for the time being. And that way. Yeah. Either, either, uh, either a defensive prospect or a top pick with a bunch of conditions attached to it. If it's Thursday when the draft happens, then yeah. it's a first. If it's a Wednesday when the trade's made, then it becomes yeah, try a second to beat and a the, third. Yeah. And uh, if Tree's wearing a red shirt at the draft, then we yeah, push it into next exactly. year. Exactly, but, uh, you know, like it, it – I think that just – you know, because like uh, Hannafin had like 45 points this past season. And like if Weger takes his spot as like the number one uh, power play guy – 
he's not going to have the opportunity to get as many points. And uh, it, it's one of those, do you diminish, you know, like if you look at, um, like say you take Hannafin out, you have Uyghur with Anderson, you have Shillington with Tanev, you have Zadorov with uh, either Mackey or Valimaki or the new prospect or Michael Stone or, or, or you know... And there's enough defense in defensive free agency. Yeah, still exactly. Fill in that, there. like, the number five six spot is fixable quite easily, and like that top four is still a really dynamite top four. And but getting like the additional scorer guy helps just because um, like if you're if you keep Hannafin and like Hannafin Anderson, then you've got Uyghur with Tanev, which is fine. And then you have Shillington with Zadorov, which is doable. And, like, the Flames will have the best defense in the NHL. It's just in terms of relative uh, value for assets, you know, you might be able to do more by moving Hannafin than keeping him just because. I don't disagree with you. I think that there's a couple things that have to happen before you look at moving a defenseman. First, you've yeah. got to get Uyghur signed. Secondly, I think you have to be comfortable that Chris Tanev is ready to go. We still don't really know the extent of his injury. And if they don't think he's going to be ready to go for the beginning of the season, I think you've got to keep Hannafin here until he is. Yeah, oh, for sure. And, uh, you know. Because I'm not comfortable with Uyghur Zadorov or Uyghur Shillington as our second yeah. pair. And it'll be interesting to see um, exactly what shakes up with all of that. But, um yeah, you because know, like they did say that Tanev would be ready for the start of training camp. So uh, yeah, it's... yeah, we've heard that before though, where a guy is ready and then doesn't play well. I mean, even if he's ready, he's got to get the rust off. Yeah. We'll see. The Flames right now have two point one million in projected cap space. I think you're right. I think that we could see a defenseman go, but. When I look around at the league and some potential forwards who could fill that spot without giving anything up, there's still some interesting names Bill out there Kessel. as free agent wingers. Phil Kessel. I, I don't know you're going to get Phil Kessel to go from $8 million to less than $2 million, though. Eh, you might. I think because he's over uh, 35, um, you could do what uh, Boston did where um, – you know make it like performance bonuses like uh you play 10 games and you get an extra two million so like we could kind of park some of the cap possibly for next season getting around that because <laughs> like uh if you look yeah. at bergeron's yeah, that... contract like it's two and a half for this year but like there's two and a half million dollars in bonuses as well so calgary could possibly do that might not be the best idea but they could yeah that yeah i don't know that's the way i would go again i think being an older guy i mean if you're looking at that and you're willing to go older you could look at uh, louis erickson as well who's older um one guy i would like to see here if we're looking for some center depth or if they're willing to play rooney on the wing would be paul stasny i think that if you've got uh lindholm um Kadri, Backlund and Stasny, you've got a really deep center. Yeah, group. well, you could even play Stasny on the wing, and he has at times in his career. So he has, so, yeah. You know, I, I, um, what would you think? You know, and, and if we're looking for a guy to sort of be a, a third line, let's call it third line right winger. Um, I mean, looking at guys available, Rocco Grimaldi still available. Sonny Milano is available. Um, you know, both those guys would be, I think, doable and cheap enough that you could probably sneak them in under that uh two million dollars and not have to move somebody out even a zach and ashton reese yeah well like uh say uh sonny milano like a guy like him might want to come to a team like calgary say sign a league minimum contract for the one year and with the idea that he's likely going to play on a good line regardless of where he is in the lineup and try to you know, cash in with like a 50, 60 point season so he can sign a huge contract for next year. Yeah. I mean, Milano made one seven last year, even if you, even if you match that, which I don't think you could, I think you could probably get him for about a million, million two, especially now as we're looking forward to, um, you know, training camp. 
I think Milano would be a great fit there. He's 26. Like you said, maybe he can get a bigger deal after this. Maybe he comes back here. Another guy that could work well there is 28-year-old Evan Rodriguez. Yep. Um, or if we want to go back to the well, we could always bring Tyler Pitlick back. Oh, gee. Yeah. <laughs> Um, actually so, not you know, to, I, you know actually getting pit like back would not be the worst idea he just had a really bad year because of getting hurt early and then like nothing went right for him the rest of the way and like he was not the tyler pit like that he's been his entire career so no but i think of the other names that we just mentioned i'd rather have pretty much all of them over pit true Another guy that could be interesting to look at is 30-year-old Brent Con- Brett Connolly, who uh, is a free agent, $3.5 million. You'd have to get a significant discount on him, but a right-handed shot who can play either wing. Yep. So, you know, I think, yeah, I think you can make that trade, but I think even if you wanted to fill in from, you know, sort of the free agent pool, there's enough guys out there, especially on the forward side, that we could do that. I mean, like you said, a Kessel, Erickson, Victor Rask, um, you know, Paul Stasny, Brent Connolly. There's lots of guys. Grimaldi, we talked about a lot of these guys that are out there that are still looking for a team. And you might even see a couple of them who, um, you know, are training camp invites. And, and that seems to happen every year now as we get those training camp invites that, um, you know, show up and – whether it's Calgary or elsewhere and end up getting a job. Yeah. But I'm, I'm surprised there's as many big, I'm surprised first off that Kadri was a free agent as long as he was. And I'm surprised we have big names like Kessel, Erickson, Rask, Stasny still as free agents. So those things, I mean, Subban on the defensive side. Does that surprise you, Matt? Uh, not really just due to the flat cap. Um, like the, basically the only teams that have money are the bad teams. So, you know, um, like Calgary was basically the only good team that actually had flexibility. Um, like the rest of the teams are like the Arizonas and uh, uh, Anaheims and like just the really bad teams. So uh, it makes sense that uh, they weren't uh, like none of those guys have signed. And like they might sign like a one-year deal with Anaheim. Just to, I think they're all going to at this point have to end up signing one-year deals. Yeah. And I think there's probably a lot of GMs waiting to see what happened with Kadri. Because I said to some people I've talked to, if not, if he doesn't sign in Calgary, there's going to be someone who's going to sign him. And sort of like uh, Monaghan, someone's going to have to move money for that. So there's going to be some money shift around the league a little bit. So I think a lot of teams, sort of like we hear at the deadline, right? Oh, everybody's waiting for X name. And once X name went, then they did their plan B, plan C, plan D. Um, so I think that might have happened here. It's like, hey, we didn't get Kadri. Now let's go get Kessel. Yeah. So I think we'll see some of these names get snapped up in the next little bit here. Um, but I think we both agree that the Flames need one more winger. Yeah, and it um, has to just be a top nine guy. Like, you could just run with Peltier, and, like, that'd be fine. But it does, like, on paper looks like you could use one more guy. And, you know, like, if you shoehorn the Dubé up in the lineup and put him either on the first or second line on the right side, would it work? Yeah, probably, but you don't want to rely on, you know, and plus for his development, he needs to have more of, you know, a, a little more time. Like, he had a really good ending of his season, and I think, like, having him on, like, the second, third line uh, to start the year, uh, like, okay, you did good, now show that that's who you are now. And, you know, I just don't see relying on him as yes he is the guy from march on instead of the guy from the beginning of the season to march so you know we'll see i i would rather like especially with the makeup of the team like this team does not have like a true superstar superstar like a crosby or an ovechkin but you know like if you make every player one through 12 and one through six and the goalie being like a really good solid player for that spot you know like the flames are going to be extremely difficult to beat and like we could be a cup team whereas if you're starting to shoehorn guys up the lineup unnecessarily you know you might run into a little bit well and then if somebody gets hurt you run into issues too i mean let's say they do put you know dubay on line one or two and he gets hurt you've still got that depth issue and i think that's been one of the flames issues in the past i mean 
I think we could look even last year and overpaid for Kelly Yarncroke just to get some depth because of Monaghan. Like, I yeah. think they've realized they just need that depth. Yeah. And, you know, like, you can waste assets by getting things at the deadline, or you can do it now, and, you know, all it costs you is money, and the Flames have some to spare, so... You exactly. Know, yeah. Get I mean, your trade deadline. If, if Yarn Croak would have turned yeah, out. Yeah. Get your trade deadline done. Deals done now when it just costs money. Exactly. Yeah. Or if you want to make a trade, trading is cheaper now. Yeah. If I look at, you know, wingers that we could bring up, if not Rujicka, and again, you, or sorry, if not Peltier, you and I have talked a lot about this. I prefer guys stay in the HL, you know, longer and over ripen. But if I look at sort of younger or, you know, players that are older that could play right wing. We've got Walker Dewar, who's 24, which, again, I don't think that's an upgrade there. I think you can find better on the free agent market. Um, Martin Pospisil, who's 22, and Clark Bishop, who's 26, who's a center left wing. So, you know, when I look at those, I don't think any of those are the right option either to be the, your, your your third line winger. Okay, um, well, the Flames, uh, the farm team, like, other than Matthew Phillips, Adam Rajitska, maybe Martin Pospisil, and uh, Jacob Peltier, like, none of the other players are really close to being ready to make the jump into the NHL. Perhaps Walker Dewar, it really just depends on, like, which player gets injured and, like, what role you're trying to fill, but... But I think that's the key there, right? Walker Dewar for injury. I mean, if I'm in a team that's win now mode, I'm not looking at Walker Dewar as being in my top nine. No. Uh, I'm looking at Walker Dewar as being an injury replacement guy or a, oh crap, I ran out of money, you'll do type of guy. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, that's important. It's just, um, yeah, not an ideal situation if he's getting put into anything beyond a depth role. And I'll be honest, I don't see Matthew Phillips as a flame this year. Outside of maybe a couple, you know, call appearances. I think with him coming back for one more kick at the can in the A, and I think this is his final season in the AHL, uh, at least in our organization. Uh, I think they brought him in for one reason, one reason only. You want to know what it is? Sell tickets for stock. Well, the Wranglers. He's a, Calgary, he's a Calgary boy playing for the Calgary Wranglers. I think it's there to sell those tickets. Yep, yeah, and it's one of those situations he might force his way into the lineup if he, you know, because he was one of the top ten players in the AHL last season in points. If he repeats that kind of performance, you know, he might force his way into the team, which wouldn't be a bad thing so you know but i think it's if he can force his way in great i think if any of these guys can force their way in but i don't want to just kind of rely on one of them as a filler when you've got you know when you're in win now mode. no and like that's why like would uh having like to fully and coleman on the right side and uh huberdo manjapane and peltier be good on the left side sure but you know having you know dube down and peltier out would be more advantageous for this team just to give more options, especially as the season rolls and on. If you're, and if you want to be a team that's going to go deep, you need to have an injury solution. And I think we've seen that in the playoffs every year. Sometimes the teams that go deep are the ones that have the deeper roster and aren't relying on Walker Dewar to fill that. And I don't think it's Walker Dewar, but I just don't think he's the guy you you know look at in the playoff stretch or even in the playoffs as your top nine injury replacement. So I think... The more the Flames can bring in the veteran guys, late 20s through their 30s, to fill some of those depth roles, I think the better off they're going to be. And even if they have a 13th forward who is, you know, one of the guys we talked about earlier, one of those free agent guys, I think you're in a better position. I mean, Brett Ritchie's still unsigned. Maybe they bring him in. But I think guys like that are who I'd rather see in the lineup right now and let – Jacob Peltier and all these guys play in the A, play close to home, and be the big fish in the small pond than being our third line winger. Yeah, and especially like say like the Flames bring in a Milano or a Kessel or a insert miscellaneous player here, and you have Peltier on the farm, and Peltier has a really good season. Well, if an injury happens, you know you're going to slot that guy up in the lineup and say, okay, kid, here's a shot and mm -hmm. you know let it be on him to take the bull and run with it and you know like it, there's no problem if he goes and puts up 40 in the a this year 
Like, he had 37 For last sure. year. Like, it, he's, like, 21. Like, it's not like he's an older prospect. He's still a kid. So, you know, like, there's no harm in him getting an extra bit of seasoning as well. And I think, you know, as Flames fans, we always want to see the hot prospect. And I think for a lot of Flames fans, that's been their way to see him is call him up. Well, now we have another way. Just, you know, go on Saturday afternoon or whenever that team plays and watch that guy. Like, I'm hoping as Flames fans, we're not in this, you know, oh, call so-and-so up so I can see them. Call Dustin Wolf up so I can see him. Just go watch the, the game where he's playing here. Go four hours earlier, whatever you got to do if they're playing in the afternoon. Like, you know, we'll have that ability to see these guys. So I think, especially when they're that close, leave them in the A and let them be the big fish in the small pond. Yep, exactly. Like, let Wolf go win the goalie of the year award. You know, like, uh, yeah. I, I'd rather, like, both Calgary and the Wranglers be. Calgary and Calgary? I know. It, it's going to take a minute because, you know, like I'm still NHL used, Calgary and AHL Calgary. You know, I'm still yeah. used to saying Stockton, but, you know, it, it, it's one of those that, you know, it, with both of the teams being elite, you you know, you're going to want to see each team be successful in their own right. And, you know, it, there's no need to rob Peter to pay Paul at this point. You were saying, you know, you're still thinking of Stockton. Um, my cousin actually said, he said, you know, in baseball, there's the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Why couldn't we be the Calgary Stockton Heat? Yes. The Stockton Heat of Calgary. Represent both yes. cities. <laughs> That's right. Um, well, talking about the HL team, Matt, we finally have an official name for the HL team. Uh, it's the Calgary Wranglers. And if you take a look at their logo, it's a flaming W. What do you think of that name? Uh it does have some history in the organization. Um, the Las Vegas Wranglers, who was their ECHL team that Derek England played on, you know, was the Flames affiliate. The Calgary Wranglers were an old WHL team. So, you know, historically in the city, it makes sense. But it's also a very boring name. Like, it, you know, like it, the Cow Cowboys would have been a little bit more interesting something not fire related might have been more I think the Cowboys would be even worse in Calgary if you're looking for interesting like that's you don't get much more stereotypical than that unless you want to be the the Calgary Stockton yeah it, 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 I'm just glad they don't have the old the old cowboy logo in the W like the original team did. yeah um yeah it's one of those things where it, you kind of knew that it was gonna suck one way or the other like you know like the Heat or, you know, the Wranglers or whatever. Like, those names are all generically, eh, they're there. You know what I would have done, and I didn't think about this until someone mentioned it uh, in uh, Flames, oh, actually on Calgary Puck. Take the old women's hockey team, the Calgary Inferno. I think that would be a good name. Yeah, I could see that. That would have been better. Like, I, I like... I, I like the sort of synergy with a flame related name, whether it's the heat or, you know, the scorch or the inferno. Um, you know, I just, I, I like there being those kind of name tie ins. Yeah. Well, it's one of those, or you could do something to mock Gaudreau and call them the Calgary cannons. <laughs> I don't know if they have the rights to that. Name. I know. I, I'm just, you know, more mocking Columbus than anything. You know, and and I think right now in in sports, especially in the NHL, vintage is hot. I mean, how many teams go with the vintage jerseys? And you know, we're doing reverse retro again this year. Like, it doesn't surprise me because vintage is hot that that's a name they went with. But at the same time, and I was saying to somebody, I don't like the name that much. They said, HL teams change their name all the time. Wait three years and they'll have a new name. Yeah, exactly. They'll be in some other city probably by then. And. I think they'll probably still be in Calgary. If the Flames own them, I think they'll probably still play here or in the greater Calgary area. But I think that, you know, they might have a, a different name. Yeah. Um, here's an interesting idea for you. If the Hitmen were to relocate, what would you think about taking the WHL team name for the HL team? Uh, not, I wouldn't. Yeah, it, it'd be like the Wranglers. It'd be like, okay, sure, why not? And... <laughs> Do you expect the Wranglers? And I think we've seen it from the from the logo that's Flames colors again. Do you expect the Wranglers to pretty much wear the same kit? Probably. It'll probably be a lot like uh, how Stockton used to have gray in their jersey instead of black. Well, and Stockton still had the black even after we got rid of the black up here. Yeah. 
So I would imagine, I think just for simplicity and the sake of sharing gear, I think it'll be the exact same jersey, just a different logo on the front. Yep. Which a lot of teams do that, yeah. really. So Same numbers, the same 5 and 2 that are the same number they just stitch upside down for Uyghurs, 52. Um, you and I have talked about that since way back in the Cowboy third jersey day. It's like, it's the same digit. They just stitch it upside down if it's a 5 and right side up if it's a 2. you got to save those pennies for the new rink. Man. I know. It, you know. I'm kind of half expecting the 3s to have uh, like a be eights but with like a red sticker over the gap in the the logo there you could do the same thing for your zero then put two threes together and put a sticker in the middle (laughs) like it just i don't know it drives me nuts and i was looking at the new uyghur jersey and 52 on them it's the same number like why why is five and two the same digit (laughs) it drives me nuts well, well, you know, it's like Mario and uh, Waluigi, or Wario. You know, you got the M upside down, so or Luigi and Waluigi. I mean, it's the same thing. Technically, Trevor Lewis and Noah Hannafin were the same number. Yeah, twenty-two and fifty-five are essentially the same number here. Yep. <laughs> and if if a guy gets hit and he's laying on the ice, he's not gonna know who the hell hit him. Yep, <laughs> that's kind of a good thing. <laughs> he's going to get hit by one and think it's the other. It's like, I don't know. It's it just, I love the, the current Flames jerseys, but that drives me nuts that the five and the two are the same. Yeah. <laughs> don't ask me why. Well, everybody has those little idiosyncrasies that irk the hell out of them. <laughs> so. Uh, well, before I get angry about the jersey and start, you know, telling people to get off my rink or my lawn or what anything like that, Matt, I think we should probably uh, shut it down for the day. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. <laughs> we will uh we'll be back closer to training camp um or if the flames do end up making a big deal and maybe moving hannafin out or something like that but when there's flames news we will be back but uh we have no set show time for our next show yet so watch us on social media twitter we are at fireside podcast facebook.com slash fireside chat of course fireside chat.ca or on instagram or fireside chat underscore podcast um, we actually got our first Instagram question this week, which I'll answer before we leave. And uh, Camaro had asked us, what are the Flames going to do about an organ player? And you and I talked last episode about Willie Jusen and his uh, unfortunate passing. The Flames actually have a job posting out for an organ player. So I was worried they might not replace him, but they're going to do it. They're looking for a new organ player. Yeah. So, Although uh, they should nice uh, to- you know, um, be willing to spend more than $100 a game. That's kind of low. But, you know, I, I saw I saw the posting actually posted on a social media site and somebody asked, would it be more expensive? Would it be cheaper to buy a player piano? Which made me laugh. Um, you know, those old ones you see yeah. at like Heritage Park where you put the reel in and they just play. So but at least we're going to get the organ music. I mean, that's always been part of the Saldome experience. Yep. And hopefully they're, uh, as, you know, anywhere near as good as what Willie did over the years. I'm sure that they, it's like, you know, replacing Peter Marr or any of our sort of legends. You've got big shoes to fill. They might be different, but I'm sure they'll be just as good. Well, Matt, uh, let's take off there and I will talk, we'll talk to you either when we get close to training camp or if the flames end up making another move. So sometime undefined between today and middle of September ish. (laughs) Sometime in the next month. We'll figure it out whenever and whenever it makes sense. <laughs> All good. Matt, you're excited about the Flames. They've got a good roster. What are you going to be cheering this year? Uh, uh, hopefully just, uh, you know, everybody meshes well that's new in the team because it's quite a bit of a shakeup. Um, it necessary, and, you know, Triliving did an expert-level job of mixing everything up. But uh, it'll just be interesting to see how everybody gels and hopefully they can hit the ground running when puck drops to start the season. Take us out. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.